All right, welcome back everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna give a really high level tutorial about how to use MATLAB for scientific computing and engineering. So this is just a super quick and dirty intro, um, by no means extensive, but it'll get you started on some of the basic things you need to you know, do matrix vector multiplications or you know, plot your data, simulate an ordinary differential equation, things like that. This is uh, from a code written by Scott Wilcox when he was a TA for my ME 564 class. And so this is just gonna follow kind of this tutorial code here. And I'm more or less just gonna walk you through, um, through these things. So this is kind of like a prerequisite, just like I assume you know, um, you know calculus and Taylor series. I'm gonna hope that you kind of uh, feel pretty comfortable with using these basic uh, kind of MATLAB functions so that you can play around with your data, plot things, analyze you know, your data and your functions uh, as you follow along in these various courses. And again, uh, more advanced stuff we'll cover as needed. You know, I'll have lots of lectures where all we do is derive Runga Kutta integrators and show how to do that in MATLAB or in Python. Um, this is really just kind of the very high level quick uh, overview. So I'm gonna jump in. Um, at the, so, so first off in MATLAB, I usually use scripts, these .m files. Um, instead of working in the command line, command line, uh, you know, command by command, I usually write a script so I can run all of the script at once or I can run these cells, which are separated by uh, percentage percentage. So you can kind of run each cell independently, one after the other if you like. That's kind of how I like to do it. And before, at the preamble of all of my scripts, I usually uh, clear all, close all, and CLC, which means I clear all the memory, I close all the windows, and I clear the command window. I clear all this junk here. So let me just do that. Um, okay, so I ran that, it cleared all of my uh, memory, closed everything, cleared. For some reason, it looks like there is still stuff in memory, but I'm pretty sure that's not true. Uh, I think if I type beta, yeah, it's like DT, so clear all close all CLC and it clears the command window. Okay, so basic operations, you can do things like add, subtract, multiply, divide, just like you would expect, um, you know, uh, asterisk is times, uh, backslash is, or sorry, forward slash is um, is divide, and then order of operations are the way that you learned in, in grade school. So two minus two times seven, MATLAB is going to interpret this as multiply two by seven first, and then subtract that from two. Or if you like, you can put in parentheses if you want to explicitly make one of these operations uh, be done first. You can assign variables, so I can, I can say the A variable is 2 plus 2. And notice I put a semicolon here. If I don't put a semicolon here, MATLAB will output that line of code, the output of that line of code. So if I run this, uh, oops, if I run this, uh, you'll notice that it's actually outputting um, two plus two, two times two, two divided by two, two minus two times seven, and two minus two quantity times seven. So if I don't specify, then MATLAB is going to output everything, every line that does a computation, it's gonna output the end of that computation. And so here, if I remove my semicolon from this, it will also output at the very last output, A equals four. So um, oftentimes you'll put semicolons around things. This is called suppressing the output. Um, the default is that MATLAB is going to spit everything out to the screen so that you can see what is being computed in real time. Okay, that's the basic operations. Um, what about loops? Okay, so you want to be able to do for loops and while loops and things like that. So pretty easy. Um, in MATLAB to create a loop. Uh, for example, in this example, we're going to count all of the numbers. We're gonna add all of the numbers up from one to 10. So we're gonna basically make a loop that loops through all of the numbers from one to 10, all of the integers from one to 10, and adds those integers to my counter. So I'm gonna start by initializing my counter equal to zero. Then in this four i i equals one to ten, what that literally does is it one da one colon ten creates a vector from one to ten in increments of one. So if I do this, it spits out this this vector one to ten, and so for i i equals one to ten, it literally is going to go through every element of this vector for i i equals one, for i i equals two, for i i equals three, four, five, and for each of those, it's going to add that. That, that II, that number, to my counter. So my counter is going to be growing. And we put a semicolon here so it suppresses the output. 
uh, and I can run this code. Okay, so we ran this code, and then count is, as you would expect, the sum of the first 10 integers is 55. Okay, we know, we know that, that's uh, 55. Um, if I wanted to output the count at each step, I would just remove this semicolon and run this, and now you see the count growing, um, you know, so the count after ii equals one, my count was, um, was one, then I add two and it becomes three, then I add three, sorry, I need to find my cursor, I add three and it becomes six, I add four and it becomes 10, five and it becomes 15, six, add six, it becomes 21, 28, 36, and so on, you get the picture, okay? So you can output um, at, at every step here if you, if you suppress, if you don't suppress that output with a semicolon. Good. Okay, so that's easy, easy, easy to write these for loops. And again, it's based on this, uh, this construction here that 1 colon 10 creates a big vector from 1 to 10 in increments of 1. I could also have said 1 colon 1 colon 10, and this explicitly says I want a vector from 1 to 10 with increments of 1. If I wanted to, I could also make this so that I'll give the same thing. And if I want to change my increment, maybe I want, uh, I want a vector from 2 to 10 in increments of 2. I say 2 colon 2 colon, colon 10. And it gives me a vector from 2 to 10 in increments of 2. I could do a vector um, 2 to 10 in increments of 3. And it's going to be you know, 2, 5, 8. And there's not an exact number uh, of 3s between 2 and 10, so it's going to stop at 8. And so you can create these vectors any way you like. I could create a vector from 1 to 5 in increments of 0.1. So it'll be um, kind of a big thing. Uh, you know, 1, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, all the way up to to five. Okay, so you can do this, um, and you can do four ii equals any of those constructions, and it's going to run what's inside this for loop for every single element of that set or that vector that's constructed. So that's really really useful. Um, if you want your your numbers, if you want something like pi, we know that pi is not three point one four one six. It has more decimals. It has infinitely many decimals. If I type format long. And then I type pi, it'll give me 16, uh, the, the full double, double float uh, precision number. So it'll actually spit out more stuff here, um, which is kind of cool. And if I do format short, it'll go back to my simple, you know, uh, compact decimal representation. Good. So that's uh, for loops. You can also do while loops. So let's say I set my counter equal to count. So it starts at 55 because I've just added them all up from 1 to 10. So counter is 55. And we're going to write a while loop so that while my counter is bigger than 10, I'm going to subtract one from the counter. And so presumably this will subtract until counter is exactly equal to 10 because that's not bigger than 10. And this uh, condition will be violated. So I'm going to run that. Uh, and of course now counter, I've subtracted one so many times until counter was no longer greater than 10. It's in fact equal to 10, that's not greater than 10. If I said while counter is greater than or equal to 10, it'll have to subtract one more until counter is nine. So I think that'll happen if I do this and counter is nine. So, so you can do greater than or greater than or equal to, pretty, pretty easy in your while loops and for loops. Okay, now let's create vectors and matrices. Super, super easy and intuitive in MATLAB. So we can create a vector. Um, so there's a few ways of creating a vector, actually. A underscore vector, um, you can use brackets and then spaces. One, two, three, four creates a vector. I'm just gonna like copy this into the command line so you can see it literally creates a row vector. One, two, three, four, we can do um, size of a vector and it'll tell us that it's a one by four vector. It's literally a row vector with one row and four columns. Um, if I do a underscore vector apostrophe, it'll turn that into a column vector. And so if I do size of that apostrophe vector, it should be a four by one column vector. Pretty useful. I could also define that. I could say a vector equals, if I didn't want so I defined it as a row vector, um, one, two, three, four, like that. 
If I want it to be a column vector, I just put semicolons between all of those entries. Semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. In MATLAB, semicolon is what tells it that it, you're starting a new row. So I can create a vector like that, and it creates a column vector. So you can create row vectors and column vectors very easily. Um, you can create a vector of ones super easily, just using the ones command. Ones of one comma four creates a row vector of ones. If I did ones of four comma one, it would create a column vector of ones, no big deal. Um, and you can create a matrix in the same way. So this creates a, a matrix by essentially stacking two rows. Let's see if this works. Um, Okay, it creates it here. I would have put a semicolon. I always put semicolons like that. I think that's really important for me visually to understand that, that those are two rows that are separated. You know, like the semicolon says I'm starting a new row. And you could have even, if you liked, defined this in the following way. You could have said, well, I'm going to define this as a, an array of arrays like this. I'm pretty sure this is also going to work in MATLAB. I hope it works. And then size of a matrix should be a two by four array. So, you know, and I could have put square brackets around every single one of these numbers and MATLAB will know, you know, oh, those are stacked in a row vector and then two row vectors on top of each other forms this matrix. Um, so pretty flexible how you define these things. And you can access the elements pretty easily. So I could say, you know, a vector of one is going to give me the first element of that. A vector of two is going to give me the second element of that vector. If I do a matrix of one comma one, it'll give me the, the first entry. If I do it of two comma one, it'll give me the first column of the second row. So it's row then column, so it should be five. If I want the whole first column, I can do that too. I say a matrix of colon comma one. This will be the first whole column, the first column. So the, the one five column. If I did colon comma two, it'll be the second column. Uh, colon comma three is the third column. If I want the whole first row, I would just do one comma colon. So again, I want the first row, all of the columns. That's how you do this in MATLAB. So really easy to pull out different sub pieces. Let's say I want the first two by two block. I would just say a underscore matrix of, um, I want the first two by two, so I could do one colon two comma one colon two. Um, that's, you know, I basically create a vector of indices for the rows and for the columns from one to two and one to two, and I can pull out that vector. If I want the middle, sorry, sorry, I can pull out that matrix. If I want the middle two by two matrix, I would do the same thing, but instead of index columns one to two, I would do columns two to three. And that's the, the middle two by two um, sub matrix of A. So really easy to pull these things out and work with these and, and analyze these. And multiplying to multiply a matrix by a vector, the sizes and shapes have to work out. So if I multiply a you know, two by four matrix, let's call it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's my matrix. If I want to multiply this by a vector, that ve vector had better be a column vector of size four by something, four by one. So one, two, three, four, um, because this is the only dimension that makes sense for matrix vector multiplication in MATLAB. I couldn't do this matrix times a row vector. I'd have to do this matrix times a column vector. Um, and so here you'll notice uh, we defined our A vector up here to be a row vector. And so here, when I want to do my matrix times that vector, I have to transpose it using that little apostrophe I told you about. And if I do that, um, let me just see what a vector is in case I overwrote it on accident. Okay, here I overwrote it into a column vector, so I can just do a matrix times a vector, because here a vector is already a column vector, and that'll give the two by one matrix after multiplying this um, matrix vector product. If I defined a to be a row vector, like up here, so now a is a row vector, then a matrix times a vector is going to give me an error because I can't multiply this matrix by a row vector. It won't work. So I'd have to take and transpose that vector, and now it's going to be totally fine. So this can be a little uh, finicky at first trying to get all these dimensions to work, but you'll get a hang the hang of it like if you, if you do 
if you practice this at all, you'll get the hang of how to make these things work out with transposes. Okay, good. Um, you can do things like element-wise uh, operations, like I can square every element of the A matrix by doing dot to the second power. So um, in MATLAB, generally speaking, any array, like an, an array A, if I do dot to the second power, it's going to square every element one by one. So it'll give me a matrix one, four, uh, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, if I run this, it should give me that square, the element-wise square of the matrix, okay? I'll point out, you can download this .m file and follow along and play with it and change it yourself. Um, this is all uploaded, um, links in the description below. Okay, good. Now we might want to create a vector of time and do things like plot functions of time and create functions of time. So here, again, I already showed you how to do that colon operation. So this is going to create a vector from minus 100 to 100 in increments of 1. So minus 100, minus 99, minus 98, dot, dot, dot. Minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. 98, 99, 100. A big vector. And that's our the time vector. You could just call it t. I don't know why we call it the time. Uh, it's just, you know, t. And then I can create functions of time. Uh, so this first function, f1, is t squared times sine of t, and my second function is t squared. And remember, this dot squared is going to element-wise square it so that it's a vector of that instant in time squared times sine at that instant. Um, so to some extent, if I have this t vector, and if I think of it as being you know, time 1, time 2, time 3, dot, 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 then what this, uh, in line 72, writing t dot squared is going to create a vector of t1 squared, t2 squared, t3 squared, dot, 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 okay? And so this allows me to plot these functions versus time point by point, okay? So this will be kind of nice. And then we can plot these things. Uh, let's run this. Oh, and then the plotting is already here. So uh, you can create a figure, um, and you can specify which figure number. So I'm creating the 40th figure for some reason. If you don't give it an argument, it'll just create a new figure. And we're plotting t by f1. We're going to plot it as a red line with line width 2, meaning it's, it's got a thickness of 2. And hold on. If I want to plot two plots on top of each other, I have to use this hold on, or else the second plot will overwrite the first plot, and I won't be able to see them on top of each other. Um, so this holds everything on the current plot. So the first plot is this uh, f1 t squared sine of t, and the second plot f2 is just t squared. And we're going to plot this one in a black dashed line of line width 2. I'm inverting the color screen on my the color scheme on my laptop so that it looks good on this black background. So this red is actually going to look cyan, and this K black is actually going to look white. But in, in, at home, these will be the right colors. Uh, and these plots, uh, you can add labels to the plot. I'm going to run this. I, I can add labels to the plot. Um, I can add legends to the plots. I can add a grid, title. Notice how it's teeny tiny. So I'm going to show you live that I can say set GCA. That's the get the current graphics axis. So set the current graphics axis. And I'm going to set the font size to be 24. So automatically, that's going to make it look way, way better. And then I'm also going to set the position, set the, the position of my figure. So each of these, so there's the graphics, sorry, there is the axes, which have things like the labels and things like that. And then there's the figure, which has properties like the position of the figure. And you'll have to get used to, you know, what is an axis property and what's a figure property. But I can also change the position uh, to something like 1,500 pixels by 500 pixels. So it's going to go over on my screen 1,500 pixels and up 500. And then I can set the width and height to be 800 pixels by 800 pixels. And if I run this, it'll run it over here and give me this nice plot that's a little bit bigger with these bigger axis labels. So lots of nice things you can do um, just like that. Um, I'm pretty sure that the set command has a dual, which is called the get command. So I think if I do like get 
GCA, it'll spit out all of the properties of this current graphics axis. So these are all the things you can change on the axes of your plot. You can change the, the tick direction from going in to out. You can change the uh, tick length or you know, the projection to orthographic. There's all these properties that you can find using get. And for every one of these properties in get, you can set them to different values. And so you can very much customize the, the, the plots, the, the, the plots. And so GCA and GCF are the two kind of main things that are the axes and then the figure itself. Plotting is really easy in MATLAB. That's one of the things I like about it, is that it's easy to play around with your data. You run some calculations and you can dump, uh, you know, you can look at your matrix and you can query your matrix. You can plot your things really, really easily, really, really quickly uh, in MATLAB. As a general rule, Okay, my plot was too tall, so I'm going to make it shorter. As a general rule, you know, always put axes labels on your plots. You know, if you want to look smart and you're presenting data, label your axes and put a legend on. Always helps when you're communicating. Okay, good. What else do I want to show you? Uh, linear systems is really important. So solving linear systems of equations, like um, if I have a matrix A and a vector, two vectors X and B. I'm going to just erase this. Um, if I have AX equals B as a matrix system of equations, so A is a matrix and X and B are vectors, let's say that I know A and I know B, and so I'm solving for X, so solve for X. That's something that's really, really easy to do in MATLAB. So here we're going to create two a matrix A and a vector B. Uh, corresponding to this system of equations here. Um, you can convince yourself that this A matrix and this B correspond to this system of equations. And solving for X is like trivial in MATLAB. It's just A backslash B. So the backslash command is one of the nice things in MATLAB. It's really easy to solve for X that satisfies this equation. And what's cool about this is that this will solve even when A is not a square matrix. So if A is a square matrix and is invertible, this will find you know inverse of A times B, the exact solution. But maybe A is a big you know overdetermined matrix and there's many, many more systems of equations than there are unknowns. So A is a tall skinny matrix. Or maybe it's an underdetermined matrix, a short fat matrix. In those cases, it'll find the X that best satisfies this in the least squares sense. So even if there's not an exact solution X, it'll find an X so that A X minus B has a minimum two norm, or so that x has uh, the length of x has a minimum two norms. Those are the least square solutions. And MATLAB's pretty clever about finding the best way of solving a backslash b, depending on the shape of a and properties of a and b. So really nice kind of built-in command here. And you could compare this against you know inv of a times b. That'll give you the same answer for the square matrix a. Okay, um, and that'll also work even for a very, very large system. Maybe I'll do one thing first. Um, I'm just gonna run this. Okay, so it gave A, B, and X, and you could confirm that A times X minus B is in fact the zero, zero vector. Okay, so that shows that it found the X that actually solves this. You can also create really big random matrices. This can be useful for testing algorithms if you want to test on a bunch of matrices using this rand n command. So rand n creates, if you give it two variables, rand n 100 by 100, this will create a 100 by 100 matrix where each entry is a normally distributed random variable, mean zero unit variance. Rand n returns, it basically samples from a Gaussian normal distribution, and it'll generate a matrix with 100 by 100 elements each with a zero mean unit variance Gaussian uh, random variable. I can make a vector of size 100 by one, so a column vector also with these rand n's, these normally distributed random variables. If I deleted the n, it would, instead of creating a Gaussian random variable, it would create a uniform random variable on the uniform interval zero to one. Okay, so you can do both of those. And again, you can solve these very large systems of equations with the backslash, and this is that big X that comes out of that solution. Okay, another thing I wanna show you is how to simulate ordinary differential equations. Like, um, let's say I want to simulate uh, 
x dot equals f of x with some initial condition x naught. We can simulate those in MATLAB using some powerful built-in numerical integrators like the Runge-Kutta fourth order scheme. Um, so <clears throat> pretty simple. This is the OD45 command is the all-purpose fourth order Runge-Kutta integrator. There's many others. There's ODE like 11s for a stiff scheme. There are uh, 112s. There's ODE23. There's a bunch of ODE schemes for stiff systems, for stochastic systems. This is a good general purpose for you know a generic system. You should start with this. And OD45 is expecting a certain number of input parameters. It's expecting a function. I called it ODE test here, or, or um, Scott did. It can be named anything you want, but it's basically a function that encodes this right-hand side of your differential equation. So in my environment um, here, there's actually this ODE test.m file which if you open that, it is a function that returns the derivative dx. So, so the, the differential equation I've written down is a two-state differential equation. So technically it's um, you know, x1 dot and x2 dot equals, and I think x1 dot equals x2, and x2 dot equals minus lambda x1 minus zeta x2. That's the differential equation we're going to simulate. And so this basically computes some stuff, and then it returns this x, which is, I would call this dx if I was writing this code. This would be, for me, dx dt. And this would be dx dt1 and dx dt2. That's totally fine. And so as long as this function returns the right-hand side of your differential equation. That's what MATLAB's ODE45 is expecting, a function that encodes the right-hand side of your differential equation. It's expecting this function may vary in time and in space, in t and in x. Um, there's no reason this has to be called x naught, uh, so I'm just going to remove that. There's also no reason to do this. <laughs> I'm just trying to clean this code up a little bit. Um, so. O ODE45 expects a function, a right-hand side vector field, this f of x. It expects that it might change in time. It might be a function of t comma x. So in general, this could encode dynamics that actually change in time. So it's like t comma x. You'll notice that my vector field, my right-hand side function, doesn't change in time. And if it doesn't change in time, it just won't have any t variables. That's fine. But MATLAB still expects the function to be defined so that it could take in a t comma x. Because its ODE45 is basically going to wrap around this ODE and evaluate it a bunch of times. And so it needs to know how to plug in different t's and x's and, and get the outputs to do its internal algorithm. Uh, so if I go back to my intro code here, um, ODE45 takes in that ODE test, uh, that, that right-hand side function. It takes in a time span, which is uh, literally a start time and an end time. This could also be a vector. I could tell it what increments to sample. I could say the time span is 0 to 10 uh, in increments of 0 0.01. That's fine. I can do that too. And it needs an x initial condition. It needs this x naught, which in this case is a vector because my system is a, a vector system of differential equations. And that's super easy. Like this ODE45 basically codes up one of the most powerful all purpose integrators, the fourth order Runge Kutta scheme. And it'll run on almost any right hand side vector field you can, you can plug into here. This will simulate that system. And it's going to output the time points that it computed and the output of the state, y out, which is going to be an array of x1 and x2 at all of these instances of time. So I'm going to run this. Um, I'm pretty sure I need to set my GCA to font size 24 so it doesn't look terrible. And I'm going to plot things with a uh, line width of, let's say, 3 just so it looks good. Oh no. What happened? OD test must return a column vector. I messed up. I got too much hubris. Uh, I flew too close to the sun. When, uh, when Scott defined this dx dt and pre-allocated that, uh, he pre-allocated it as a vector, a, um, a column vector. So I think I'm going to say column 1, column 2. So I'm making sure that dx dt is a column vector. This should work now. And let's try this again. OK, good. It didn't crap out this time. Uh, set GCA font size 24. 
Okay, it's having issues. I'm having a lot of issues today. Uh, my legend, uh, there's an error in my legend. Uh, error, setting property position of class legend. Okay, maybe I won't move my legend. Let's not do that. Um, I also don't like titles, to be honest with you. Um, let's try this. Oh, yeah, okay, here's the problem. Um, let me get rid of this. I'm just going to comment all of this out for now. And here, now this looks better. Okay, so here what we've done is we've plotted... Um, T out comma Y out, so it plots this Y out as a function of time, and Y out has size. Let's let's look at the size of Y out. Y out was the output of my Runge Kutta integrator, and it's size 1001 by 2. So this is actually a huge two-column matrix, which is weird because I think of my state as being a column vector, but it gives me this big, you know, a thousand entries in time for X1 and for X2. And so when I plot T out by Y out, it's basically going to plot, you know, the first column in one color and the second column in another color. I think the first column corresponded to position and the second column corresponded to velocity of a system. And so if I run this, uh, maybe I can keep my legend uh, this time. It's really not liking my legend. Um, there must be legend, uh, I think maybe I want an array of legends, let's try this. Yeah, that's better. No, nope, that's not better. Uh, position, comma, velocity, this is not gonna work. Okay, if I wanted, I would say help legend, and it would tell me how I messed up my legend. Um, let's see, there are two variables here. Yeah, this really should work. Uh, position and velocity. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is stupid. Um, legend has a property called its position. I can move that legend to the upper left or to the upper right or to the lower left or the lower right. And so this, I, here I meant position and velocity, but it's thinking I'm trying to overwrite the position variable with something called velocity. This is, this is confusing. Let's say position comma x and velocity comma v. This should work. And now it doesn't have a problem. Okay, so that's stupid. Um, Anyway, this is my plot. It looks really nice, and it plots those two uh, positions and velocities that output from my ODE integrator. So really, really powerful stuff. The, the headline here is that you can do ODE integration of almost any vector field, even if it changes in time, even if it's high dimensional. It can have 100 states. It can be very nonlinear. You can solve it using ODE 45, and you can plot and analyze the results uh, using your plotting techniques. Um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to tell you. There's also some code in here to animate your plots, which is cool, so you can make movies, which look really nice. Um, you know, so essentially we're going to, um, you know, for, I, for j equals 1 to the length of a movie, we're going to plot some stuff. And using this get frame, it's going to take whatever that plot was and create a frame in a movie. And then when you're done with that for loop, you can run the movie command on all of those frames, and it'll stitch those together. Really, really easy. Um, hopefully this works. Uh, you can't see it here because it's so faint. Uh, but you can see this little sign, you know, this little function is being curved out and it's going to create this movie uh, once, once it's made all of these frames. And then you can do things like actually save this movie to an MPEG or an AVI file or a .movie file and, and, or a GIF, whatever you like, okay? Good. So that's really the high-level overview of just quick and dirty MATLAB. This is by no means everything, but this will give you a good basis to start. Things like how to build a matrix, how to build a vector, how to multiply them, how to solve a matrix system of equations, how to write down a vector field and integrate it and plot. You know, that's most of what you're going to do. Anything more advanced, we're going to build from scratch. So in a lot of my videos, you'll see there's MATLAB and Python code where we use these basic commands to build up more complicated functions and we use other more complicated built-in commands, but this gives you at least, you know, 
most of what you need to get started to kind of code up your own stuff to play around with your data and to plot things like that. All right, thank you.